Okay, hello um, everybody and welcome once again to QIS 302, a practical guide to superintendent qubit experiments. This is our fifth of eighth lecture. Um, just as a reminder, we will be back Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern. We will not be around July 3rd at 1 p.m. And then we will be back the, um, the fifth and seventh to finish off the series again, all at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our speaker today is Chin Wang from UMass Amherst. Uh, Chin needs no introduction, uh, particularly because he has been the host of uh, several of these uh, lectures up to this point. And today he's going to tell us about analyzing decoherence channels and superducting qubits. Take it away, Chin. All right, so let's get going. So just a, a reminder to everyone of our course series. So this is the, the fifth class of, uh, of eight on a practical guide to superconducting qubit experiments. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, analyzing decoherence channels. So uh, I got asked about uh, um, kind of a reference materials in general for this class. So there are actually uh, quite a number of uh, good overall review papers in this uh, in this area. So I'd like to recommend a few of these. So this is a, a circuit quantum electrodynamics uh, review of modern modern physics uh, by uh, Alexander Blaise and a few others. And uh, then this one, a quantum engineer's guide to superconducting qubits. I think this is uh, really help, quite helpful and uh, very well written all around. And also this one, uh, which I was a co-part of the authorship team, uh, was more on the practical side, which is actually uh, somewhat closer aligned to the idea of this tutorial series. So uh, these are the things that I encourage you guys to read. They kind of range from the more formal side to the more uh, practical experimental side. So, um, on this paper, actually, it's also constructed somewhat like our lecture series. So uh, we discuss um, the, the kind of a loop of how to run these experiments. As I remember, Wade, I talked to you guys about uh, qubit design. So you start with some kind of a target Hamiltonian. You have some target Hamiltonian. You go through the cycle of a do running simulation design, chip design, and you do fabrication and you characterize and you correct whatever mistake you make in terms of both Hamiltonian parameter and the material properties and dimensional kind of adjustments. So um, we have a few other lectures you've already learned from like uh, uh, device design and uh, characterization from previous lecture. There are a few more to go. And the next, next lecture you're going to learn about uh, qubit fabrication. And throughout the cycle, uh, in addition to getting the right frequencies and couplings, there's always this theme of how do I get a good coherence out of, um, out of my qubits? So this is a very complicated and multifaceted question. So um, in this class, we're going to talk about uh, somewhat uh, on the, towards the, um, the more um, experimentally relevant and practical aspect. What are the areas of consideration in order to achieve good coherence times? And how does your qubit characterization inform uh, potential areas of improvement? So on the coherence topic, I particularly recommend uh, uh, this uh, quantum engineer's guide paper. It has a, has a full chapter uh, discussing in a relatively basic but still formal manner of how to think about uh, noise and decoherence in superconducting uh, qubits. So uh, this class, I'm not going to go through these things in, in a formal detail, but I would like to uh, focus on the most uh, limiting and the most relevant um, physical channels in, in your typical superconducting qubit, especially the transmount qubit. And then we will touch about, upon a few of these uh, formal formalisms of, uh, of analyzing decoherence. So uh, I will start by um, discussing um, Overall, why do superconducting qubits lose coherence after all? Um, we promise a qubit and a qubit is a two-level system, right? And uh, ideally, uh, the qubit will just live forever. So what are the, the various ways that they lose co coherence? And uh, this is sort of like a, a graphic, a pictorial representation of all the various things that can go wrong because we put our quantum information into, um, into, into a large piece of solid state material after all. 
and you have uh, free electron spins, you have magnetic vortices in your superconductor, there's quasi particles, there's two level system in dielectric, surface has other chemistry and you have radiation. So there are really like many, many different things that can go wrong in your, in, in your superconductor. So we're going to touch upon some of these things that are especially relevant to your everyday qubit nowadays, let's say a transmog. Okay, so um, I'd like to start by um, distinguishing, making a distinction between these two different things that we're going to uh, we're going to discuss. One is called dissipation, and one is called this dephasing. Dissipation is also known as uh, energy relaxation. So uh, these two things are quite different and analyzed differently. So dissipation, this is also known as longitudinal relaxation. Uh, if you have a block sphere and uh, we can represent the pole state zero and one as the energy eigenstate of your qubit. So this will be called your ground state and this is the first excited state of your qubit. So longitudinal relaxation means that uh, if your qubit is prepared in the excited state, and if you assume your environment is cold, it's going to ev eventually relax towards its ground state and lose energy to the environment. So this is a process where environment exchange excitation with the qubit resonantly. So this interaction happens at the qubit at the qubit frequency. And this is known as the T1 process. And you have the gamma one, which is inverse T1, is called the longitudinal relaxation time or T1 time or energy uh, dissipation time um, for your qubit. And then there is also this dephasing process. Uh, this dephasing means, uh, we call it pure dephasing. It means there is no energy exchange, no direct energy exchange between your qubit and the environment. So this is a process where environment modulates the qubit frequency. So if your qubit is prepared in the, in the equator state, it should just process around the z-axis uh, uh, at the qubit frequency. And if you, you're in the rotating frame of the qubit, then this vector would be fixed at the equator state. But if you have uh, environment noise that modulates your qubit frequency, your qubit frequency fluctuates, then this vector will precise, will process randomly uh, along the equator. So this will give you um, not a relaxation, but it will it will it will dephase your qubit, meaning you start to lose track of uh, uh, of the phase of your quantum superposition between zero and one. So this is not a time that we directly measure. Experimentally, we would measure this uh, so-called transverse relaxation or decoherence time. So uh, what you do is you prepare your qubit in the equator state. And after a while, you, uh, you measure, let's say, the, the projection of the qubit along the x-axis by doing a pi over 2 rotation and the measure and perform a z measurement, typically. What you measure is called the T2 time. And the T2 time actually has two components. One is this pure dephasing, as we just talked about, that, he, that actually wrote, moves the vector around so to, you lose coherence. So your x will become y or even minus x. Then it also has a contribution from the energy relaxation or T1. That is because every time if your qubit relax from the equator to the ground state, then you also completely lose track of the, the phase information. So generally, experimentally, you're going to do a T1 measurement to know your, your uh, gamma 1, and you're going to do a T2 measurement, and you're going to use this formula to subtract out the T1 contribution, and you're going to learn what is the, the dephasing time of your of your qubit. Okay, so uh, a question naturally you may ask is uh, which one of these two things are uh, practically more important or more limiting? So uh, I would say that it really depends on the style of the qubits. Different qubits have different uh, sensitivity, dif have different sensitivities to, to these different uh, physical processes. For example, some of the qubits can be made to be uh, to be really not sensitive to some of the some of the channels. So some of the qubits currently are more um, dissipation limited, and some are more dephasing limited. And um, but there is a there is some difference. Uh, I think it's fair to say we have stronger means to suppress the dephasing processes without giving up on the on the on the dissipation on on, on T one time. For example, for single junction transmons, one can really suppress the dephasing time quite well, while the, the transmon would still have a good, good T1 time. 
Uh, and therefore, I think it's fair, perhaps fair to say that dissipation is the more fundamental bottleneck right now. If we can have uh, uh, extremely long P1 time for, for, for a transmog, then you can use fixed frequency transmog, and that probably will become really the, 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 the really a, a very good qubit to use. However, uh, there are qubits that are less protected from dephasing, such as flux tunable qubits. Um, they may, uh, you open up a different uh, extra dephasing channel, but they may give you an advantage in terms of controllability. So therefore, um, people still like those qubits, even though they may have a, have a, have more decoherence. Uh, and therefore, I would say uh, both dissipation and dephasing are almost like on equal footing in terms of uh, importance of investigation and improvement in, in today's uh, various uh, superconducting qubit architecture. And uh, now let's uh, go by uh, go by the two parts of our talk. We're going to uh, first talk about dissipation, and then we're going to talk going to talk the, talk about dephasing. And dissipation in qubits. Uh, I'm not going to start to introduce like operator formalism to begin with. Uh, I like to kind of uh, just to take the a more classical approach to think about to, to let you guys uh, uh, understand how to think about dissipation. Uh, essentially, for a transmog, we're going to focus on the transmog. So other qubits will be will be more complicated. For a transmog qubit, uh, let's say you have a you have a, a junction and a capacitor. Maybe you have an external shunting capacitor, uh, maybe a linear inductor. But that that will that will make it a different type of qubit. But but that's fine. So we can think about this as just an LC oscillator, and. Uh, if you grab an inductor and you grab a capacitor, you build an LC circuit on the lab. And obviously, your LC oscillator is not going to oscillate forever. It's going to lose energy, right? So uh, where does the dissipation come from? It's, uh, it's very clear that your capacitor is not perfect. Your wire is not perfect. Your inductor is not perfect, right? So you can just think about uh, these different elements. Let's say this is your junction capacitance, junction inductance external capacitance, external inductance, all of these L and Cs are not ideal Ls and ideal Cs. They all have a, some kind of a dissipative resistive element associated with it. So this is a completely classical analysis that applies to, to transmogs re really well. You can just think about to you the, the imperfection of your capacitances and your, your inductances. And then there's additional channel because this is at what microwave frequency. There's also radiation to, to, to be concerned with. Your, uh, your, your electromagnetic field can be broadcasted into, into space. So in the high Q limit, in the limit that your LC oscillator is extremely well made, then the total loss rate, you can simply use a sum, summation of a loss rate contribution from each of these different elements. And that will give you a very, a very good uh, baseline of analyzing where your dissipation is coming from. So Chen, we have the first couple of questions. Okay, okay sure. Um, question number one, are all of these decoherent sources removable in principle? Um, I think I think in principle is maybe a, um, it, 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 I think I think here too, it's it's difficult to say because uh, um, some of those are are like a practically easier to remove and some of those they are they're practically so hard that uh, uh, you can you 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 basically have to have to solve uh, puzzles that we currently do not understand to to remove those uh, th those channels. So uh, these these things are all related to to microscopics oftentimes of your of your circuit. So yeah, I, I wouldn't say they are in principle removable uh, unless you're thinking about like an idealized picture. If you can put up put atom by atom build together and you can you can exactly think about it that way. Okay, uh, next question. So does longitudinal relaxation also cause a dephrasing problem? Uh, longitudinal relaxation does not cause, uh, uh, lo longitudinal relaxation would cause uh, a decoherence, but would, we don't call it uh, a pure dephasing here. So it's a matter of terminology. Uh, if you measure T2, that includes uh, this longitudinal relaxation. Um, okay, and then um, what's the difference between decay from E to G versus the thermal equilibrium? So this depends on the depends on the environment temperature. So if your environment is completely cold, 
uh, then your qubit will only have this relaxation from one to zero. And if your environment is, uh, if your environment temperature is, uh, uh, is a good fraction of your qubit frequency or comparable, then you'll also have a strong excitation process from zero to one. And both of these are called longitudinal relaxation. But uh, would you, maybe this is a question from me, the T1 is still the time to return to equilibrium in whatever scenario you're in, right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, so okay, okay. So uh, T1 experimentally you measure is actually equal to the sum of the inverse of uh, gamma up, uh, gamma one up and gamma one down. So right. um, yeah, yeah. So the T1 you measured actually includes contribution from both of these processes. Great. And then um, let's see. Sorry, we're collecting questions uh, at, a, at a strong rate here. Um, okay, I think some of these questions we're gonna have to wait till, till you get a little further in. So, so sorry, go ahead and try to get right. some more way and then we'll bring these questions up as they arise. Okay, 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 no problem. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about these three different things, radiation, capacitive loss, and inductive loss in this kind of LC circuits. So uh, let's start with uh, radiation first. So imagine you have a superconducting qubit like uh, a transmon. You have a giant capacitance as you as you giant capacitors as you know these days. So you have Josephson Jonkin in, in the middle, and you have capacitors. So a transmon qubit, due to this construction, it always have ha have a very large electric dipole. And this thing, if you just put it on your table and you have uh, no, other, uh, elect oh, no other metals around it, uh, this thing is going to radiate like crazy. You can calculate that it broadcasts its energy. This is LC oscillator after all. It's going to broad broadcast its, its energy into the free space. And it's going to have a very short energy relaxation or T1 time. So it's crucial that your qubit must be boxed in. It must be protected in a box. So experimentally, you use say 3D cavities, which you also, it's also going to be dual purpose as your radar resonator or storage resonator, or you engineer a sample box around it. And this thing is crucial uh, to make sure that your, your qubit mode is boxed in. And the reason is that if you have qubit in a free space, uh, the vacuum has it's a continuous density of state function, and it has uh, a lot of uh, modes at the qubit frequency, and your qubit can, can, can exchange energy with these modes living in the free space. And if you put it in a box, then your box hopefully has discrete modes um, and uh, hopefully has no modes very close to your qubit frequency. And this is how uh, you manage to shape the electromagnetic mode environment of your qubit and therefore uh, to have it not to radiate as crazy as in, in the free space. So Chen, and, we have a yeah. question from the yeah. audience. Yeah. What's that blue and gray thing in the top left? Oh, okay, okay, sorry. So this is uh, the blue here is, uh, is uh, metal. And in this case, it's a uh, tamplum of uh, uh, electrodes of, uh, of a transmount qubit. And the gray is uh, is just uh, is the dielectric substrate. Uh, it's like a sapphire substrate. And so they ask, where's the inductance and where's the capacitance? Uh, okay, so the inductance is here in the middle, in the in the center point. That's the uh, this 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 is the where the Josephson junction is. And uh, this blue region, they are they are the they are um, they they form a, a pair of a, capa a capacitor. So the electric field runs from the top blue um, top blue pad to the bottom blue pad, or vice versa. Um, yeah, so you can see the the length scale is very large. This is a macroscopic sized uh, electric dipole. And maybe the um, if they don't have good eyes, can you show them where that is in the bottom left picture? Uh, so the bottom left picture is a different another version of uh, of a transmount qubit. So this is centimeter scale cavity, and uh, there is a transmon in the middle. And uh, this transmon has uh, basically a Josephson junction in the middle and the two, and the two pads on the side, uh, similar to that. And uh, it's very small, so it's hard to see, but you can sort of see it even on a centimeter scale photo picture. So that's a, that's a, that's a pretty macroscopic <laughs> scale object. 
And the, the other question was, um, is the trans one more of a dipole or electric moment or a dipole, sorry, a magnetic or electric dipole in terms of how you think about it? Um, a trans one is more like an electric dipole. So uh, the reason is that um, for trans one, actually, uh, as, as an LC oscillator, uh, it should have equal energy of in equal part of electric energy and magnetic energy or capacitive energy versus inductive energy. Um, but the capacitor of the, of the trans mount is primarily made out of uh, this, uh, this pair of electrodes. So the electric field lives in the free space, free, free space. Uh, for the most part, but the inductive energy or magnetic energy for the most part lives within the Josephson jun junction itself. So it doesn't get broad broadcasted as much as, um, as ele electric field energy. All right. Okay, so let's move on. So this is the first order protection against the radiation. But after you have these box, the box has modes. These are your box modes. The box has resonances. Your qubit will still decay through virtually exciting these cavity modes, otherwise known as the, the Purcell effect. And another way to think, of, one way to think about this is because your qubit couple, your qubit should couple to your cavity. And uh, coupling means hybridization. So your qubit mode will have uh, some electric and magnetic field that is uh, that that lives through the in, inside this cavity. And if your cavity decays, then your qubit will also have a small chance of decay. This is what the Purcell effect is. And you can actually uh, have a very uh, simple way to to think about uh, um, how to think about the Purcell calculation. Um, imagine you have a two oscillators. Uh, I'm going to just pretend our qubit is an oscillator. This is an oscillator Hamiltonian. My Q and the Q dagger represents the annihilation creation operator of my qubit. And A is, uh, let's say, your cavity, for example, your readout cavity. And these two oscillators couple through, through couple with each other through some kind of excitation exchange with each other. And if your qubit mode is perfect and your cavity mode has some loss, let's say this mode is lossy. It has a decay rate of kappa. And we consider the weak coupling limit. And the condition is that the coupling rate G is much smaller than the detuning between your qubit and your between your qubit and your cavity. So this is what we call the the the, the, the dispersive limit or the, the very weak hybridization limit. So the cube the cavity is primarily still cavity. It does not inherit too much of the qubit character character. Now you can. Uh, this couple system dynamics, if you, we really treat this as coupled oscillator linear system, you can actually use a use a, a, a an effective Hamiltonian matrix to which includes the imaginary part to um, to represent dissipation. So this uh, imaginary part with a coefficient of kappa over two um, is representing the imaginary frequency of your of your resonator. The imaginary frequency represents um, essentially loss of the of, of a linear resin, linear oscillator. You put this as your coupled Hamiltonian. You can diagonalize it, and uh, you get two eigen eigen two eigen states or two eigen modes. And you see that now your qubit, not the eigen mode, the the eigen mode of this uh this, your qubit now inherits an imaginary part through this diagonalization process. And uh, this code, this number here uh, represents this this imaginary part represents the loss rate of your of your qubit oscillator, and you can see that uh, the form this is a very important and easy to remember equation. Um, your qubit dissipation rate um, is proportional to the the dissipation rate of the cavity which you, you inherit loss from. Uh, multiplied by a, a quadratic function of g over delta. So you can think about g over delta as uh, as the as the wave function admixing admixing between the qubit and the cavity, and square it will tell you how much does the qubit energy, how, what is the percentage of the qubit energy that lives in the resonator, and this percentage multiplied by by the cavity decay rate will tell you how much the the qubit would inherit a loss rate from the cavity. So this is a this is a very easy to use formula that give you a pretty good idea on how much uh, your qubit is expected to radiate through the cavity mode. 
So in practice, there are various complications you have to think about. Uh, one is that there might be multiple cavity modes, and uh, even your package may contain many other modes that you may or may not have a, have a clear grasp of. So the idea in, in making these packages is really to make sure these uh, highly these dense packed modes or the continuum must be way, way above your qubit frequency so that you the Purcell effect from your qubit to these modes should be kept minimum. And you, you need to be managing only a small number of uh, well-known modes so that you can model the Purcell effects relatively well. So uh, yeah. Chin, a terminology question. I think on the last slide you used Omega Q and on this slide oh. you used Omega Big T and I think oh, that oh, confused oh. your audience. Yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, sorry, this is uh, Omega Q, Q stands for qubit and Omega T here. Uh, okay, so this should be Omega Omega Q. Uh, I think Omega T inherits- It's T for transmon, but- uh, for transmon. Yeah. Okay, and then there was another question. Last time Lev told them about uh, chi. Yeah. So they want to know what's chi in the, you know, in these units. Ah, okay. Okay. So, um, so for trans, so in this calculation here, uh, it works for two oscillators or it works for an oscillator and a transmon. So in this particular case in Purcell, uh, chi does not really have its role here. But, well, but the, if yeah. you do have a if you do have this object to be a transmon, it has an enharmonicity. Then chi can be also written in units of uh, g and delta. So chi comes up to be equal to g square over delta square multiplied by the q by the transmon enharmonicity alpha. So that is also a convenient expression of uh, of the dispersive shift chi in terms of uh, these units. So combining these two, oftentimes you can estimate Purcell loss based on what is the dis dispersive shift of your transmon versus the cavity. That's a, that's a, that's another um, helpful um, direction to, to, to estimate the Purcell loss. Okay, great. And then there's a question here about like what these losses mean, kappa. So like if this was a copper cavity, would you get a different Purcell limit or protection? Uh, good question. So in this, in this case, kappa, uh, represents the total loss rate of the cavity. So if your cavity has an output pin, has a is coupled strongly to the transmission line, or if the cap the cavity is coupled uh, is coupled to some normal electron bath, if it's a copper cavity, uh, it will be treated in exactly the same way as uh, in, as this method. Assuming that your qubit does not couple directly to these dissipative baths, your qubit is talking through the cavity. Uh, to those baths, then the calculation would be the same. Great. And then um, just a reminder to the audience, if you want to ask a question, please type into the Q&A. Don't, don't raise your hand. That won't work. Thank you. All right. And we just talked about radiation. So radiation, uh, barring complicated modes of a, of, a, of a difficult package. Otherwise, for the known cavity modes, it is a known calculation to do. And if it's very distributed, you may need to do numerical simulations, but generally you have to know what your Purcell loss is, and that is part of your qubit design. Okay, now let's talk about a capacitance. So for capacitance, for inductance, generally you can write your loss rate as contribution from each element, and the contribution, loss contribution from each element, you can further write that as relative weight of that element multiply by the lossiness of the element. So the relative weight means how important, how much does, uh, does this capacitor or this, this inductor play in, the, in your LC oscillator mode, mode, which is called the participation ratio. This is multiplied by how, how lossy, how bad that element is, uh, which you can express as one over quality factor. So quality factor, it tells you uh, essentially how perfect your capacitor or inductor, your total oscillator is. The, the larger the quality factor, the more, um, uh, it roughly represents how many oscillations uh, your, your, your oscillator can, can carry. Okay, so um, now capacitive. Let's think about capac for capacitors, participation ratio uh, can be defined as the electric field energy stored in element I 
uh, divided by the total electric field energy. This will give you the, what we define as participation ratio of the ith element. Uh, for example, if we simply just divide our capacitor into two parts, one is the junction capacitor, one is the environment capacitor. For a transmog, you know, this is small, this is large, right? So if you have a parallel circuit like that, like your transmog, the largest capacitance matters most for, for this parallel combination because the participation ratio for your junction capacitor is equal to junction capacitance divided by the total. The environment capacitance, uh, environment participation ratio would be would be in the environment capacitance divided by the total. So now your total uh, calculation of what is the total uh, capa total quality factor of your capacitive circuit. Note that the this uh, this Q factor of your total circuit is inverse is uh, is directly proportional to the T1 time of your resonator or T1 time of your your transmog qubit. So this is simply a weighted average of the inverse quality factor of these, these constituent components. For example, if your junction has 5% participation ratio, your, your environment would have 95%. Now, if your junction has a quality factor of a million and the environment is perfect, you're going to get your total Q to be 20 million. And on the other hand, if your environment has Q of 1 million and your junction is perfect, your total Q will be more or less just a million because the environment is the dominant factor in this uh, in, in this uh, participation ratio analysis. So you may ask, uh, up what where what what's what's causing these quality factor? What do how how do I know if a thing has a high quality factor or low quality factor? So this uh, uh, we sometimes talk about quality factor of a certain material, or we sometimes talk about this uh, this concept called so called loss tangent. Loss tangent is the inverse of the quality factor of a material, and uh, it's defining the following. Um, for dielectric constant or relative permeability of any dielectric material, we know this is the definition, that's your electric displacement vector, this is the electric field vector, and their proportionality coefficient here is this epsilon r, epsilon naught. Epsilon r is the relative permittivity, and if you measure these these epsilon r's, uh, in general, you hope they are just a real number, but they may have a small imaginary part. And this imaginary part indicates this, uh, this, uh, this dielectric material may contain some dissipation. It's not just a completely capacitive response, but it has uh, some, some resistive response as well. And the loss tangent is defined macroscopically or phenomenologically as the, the ratio uh, we, we usually write loss tangent as 10 delta, which could be a function of frequency. Uh, this 10 delta is defined as the ratio of the imaginary part to the real part. And uh, ideally, this thing should, would be zero. You hope it's zero because zero gives you no dissipation. And in practice, it's pretty close to zero, uh, but it's often not exactly zero. And one thing you may ask is, shouldn't just a, a perfect crystalline material that we'd like to use should just shouldn't they just have a tangent delta equal to zero and uh, I think so far we don't even know uh, we don't even know if 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 material is perfect then the then the 10 delta would just have to be zero so uh, I mean there's uh, um, the we, we we don't have the resolution at this point to grind you can always uh, you can always ask for what is what is the precision of these conclusions of whether it's zero or not and uh, but of course we know if you have imperfect materials such as crystals with defects or amorphous materials then these materials can have many metastable microscopic con configurations so this is the type of picture people draw up for example for aluminum oxide uh, it's a glassy um, dielectric media, so these uh, these atoms, their layout do not exactly follow a crystalline order, and therefore you have many of these microscopic degree of freedom. So, like uh, atoms can tunnel with each other, can have dangling bonds, and you may have charge trap states. So these things, these microscopic uh, degree of freedom, in general, they would behave as uh, what we um, know as two level systems. So there are many candidates and therefore these are just uh, some kind of um, pictorial representation people don't exactly know what these things are and what kind of atom groups they are they're made out of uh, there are many candidates and the microscopic models of these things are not exactly known and furthermore 
if your material contain these things and these things can carry can absorb energy from your from your from your capacitor then after they gain energy where do they dump the energy to and how does that happen that is also an, a, a process that remain to be investigated so uh, this is a nice review paper on on two level systems in the context of uh, superconducting qubits that uh, if you'd like to learn more about these things this is a this is a good good review paper to read. Okay, so now that we've uh, described that, if you have- bad Sorry, Chen, a couple yeah. questions. Yeah, okay. um, does the permittivity depend on geometry? Um, here, the permittivity, it is a material property. So that means uh, um, it does not depend on geometry. And then there was a second question. Why would the material have an imaginary part to its permi permeability? Or permittivity. Uh, yeah, so so you, you can see that this discussion up to this point, it is completely phenomenological. And if you the material can be described by an epsilon with an imaginary part. And now here I talk about why it would 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 such an imaginary part um, show up. And uh, one prevailing hypothesis is the presence of uh, two level systems, assuming your material is not perfect. Um, yeah, but why would it have that exactly? Fundamentally, if you get rid of these TLS, then is whether this is exactly zero? I think these are still um, open questions. And then um, let's see. Uh, the can TLSs appear anywhere, including inside the JJ, or only like on the substrate? Uh, TLS can appear in any like uh, crystals with defects that means if your substrate is not just the perfect perfect then it can have uh, can have tls jj certainly may have tls because it's aluminum oxide and one more place that is very important to qubit construction is any kind of uh, surface between your superconductor and the air or between the superconductor and the substrate that is a particular place that uh, you have to you have to think about they may contain tls all right and now one of our skeletons in the closet uh, do we have a broad range of dielectric material options uh that is a good question so uh for a while people have been trying to develop trying to like deposit dielectric materials when they make qubits um, but in the past, like uh, 10, 15 years, people have uh, started to not do that. Essentially, we are, for the most part, dealing with the native oxide of the of the superconductor. And that that is, uh, okay, okay, so so let, let, let's take a, um, sorry, let, let, let me take a step back. Uh, because dielectric materials, they could have TLS, they have this, uh, this uh, lost tangent. Therefore, the goal of making good qubits is to use as perfect dielectric as possible. So what is the most perfect dielectric? It is vacuum. So uh, the first step is you try to use vacuum as much as possible. And oftentimes, it is not always possible. Then the second best choice is a, is a crystalline substrate. So you want to use the, a crystalline substrate. Uh, generally, people work with the uh, with high purity silicon or high purity uh, sapphire, uh, those will be your choice of dielectric. And uh, your goal is to use only these dielectric and nothing else in your, in, your, in your qubit. But that is also not possible because for one thing, uh, your junction is made out of aluminum and aluminum oxide. So aluminum oxide is certainly a dielectric that comes into play in your, in your qubit. So you have to understand and live or die with the possibility of having having any, any TLS in your aluminum oxide. And secondly, if your qubit is made out of aluminum film or niobium film or tantalum film or any other film, then those film will also, also have surface oxide. And those surface oxide will also become your, your dielectric of your qubit. So they will also have to be, have, have to be analyzed. And then there was um, just one more, hang on, well, there's several more, but one more before we let you escape. Um, 
why did you draw the, the stuff in between the layers was ALOX instead of AL2OX, or sorry, AL2O? Um, so these are this 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 uh um the the um the elemental composition of aluminum oxide. I think it's it may be close to aluminum two oxide oxygen three, uh, but it actually is amorphous. So the composition actually can vary. So it has a different uh, different bonding configuration. So this is generally um, people write just an X as representing the numbers may vary. All right. So now let's talk about as we as I've already alluded to. Uh, you may try to the best way possible to construct your capacitor is to do it out of vacuum. So uh, here's the thing: if you make a vacuum capacitor, this is a parallel plate capacitor. Let's imagine this is metal. This is metal, and it's vacuum in between. And if your metal is made out of, let's say, aluminum, uh, aluminum will oxidize in, the, in air and you're going to form a surface layer of oxides. Let's say this oxide layer is very thin. T is very much smaller than the, than the parallel plate capacitance you make. And vacuum is perfect, hopefully, right? And your, your aluminum oxide may have, a, may have a, some lost tangent. Uh, which will contribute to the to the total dissipation of your parallel plate capacitor. And we can do this analysis of what is the participation ratio of this surface oxide layer. And uh, it's an easy calculation. This is your parallel plate capacitance formula. You can calculate E field in vacuum in the middle. This sigma is the surface charge density divided by epsilon naught give you the E field in the middle. And the E field in the surface layer, you have to know the dielectric constant of the surface layer. And um, you can calculate that. And you can calculate what is the total E field, uh, what, is the, what is the total energy of electric field in the vacuum or in your total capacitance. That's this number. And what is the total electric field energy stored in the surface layer? It's this number. The ratio of these two is what we call the surface dielectric participation ratio written here. You can see it's very easy to understand. This is how thick your surface layer is. This is how thick your total parallel plate uh, distance is. And then there's a ratio of dielectric constant between vacuum and the surface layer. And uh, you can check that for a parallel plate capacitance. The closest thing to it to in our uh, circuit QED world is the rectangular cavity. And if you think about a TE101 mode, which I'm not going to go into detail, it very much looks like a parallel plate between the two, uh, with the D is equal to one of the dimension of your cavity. And between three nanometer surface oxide versus like five millimeter cavity width, and some surface dielectric constant, which we don't even know what exactly it is, let's assume 10 for aluminum oxide, you get participation ratio of 10 to the minus seven. This tells you that you can throw in like a, the, 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 a horrible junk on your surface, as long as it's relative much thinner, very thin compared to, the, to your box, you will still get a good quality factor out of the entire capacitance uh, because the, this participation ratio is so low. So this is the principle of like working with the 3D cavities because the surface layer uh, only uh, contains a very, very small fraction of the total field. So even if your surface is lossy, it does not carry a big weight. That's the whole idea of, um, of, uh, of uh, using larger structures. Now, if you have a parallel plate filled with some kind of uh, uh, dielectric, uh, let's say this is your substrate. Imagine you have a sapphire wafer and you put aluminum on top and on bottom of your sapphire wafer. Then you can make uh, a parallel plate capacitor like that. And going through the whole calculation, you're going to see that uh, now the surface participation ends up to be the ratio of the distance, uh, thickness of the surface to T, top, top and bottom, divided by the parallel plate distance, multiplied by the, uh, by the ratio of the dielectric constant between the substrate epsilon D and the surface epsilon S. So assuming these two are similar, and if we consider, say, your sapphire wafer has a thickness of 500 micron, you're going to get 10 to the minus 5. That's also still pretty good. If your loss tangent is, let's say, 1%, you're going to get a total quality factor of 10 to the 7th. So uh, if you can make, if you can use the entire thickness of the wafer 
as your dielectric as your dielectric material. That is also a good strategy to go. But unfortunately, generally, you cannot make qubits that way. But you can you do can make resonator this way. So things that are closer to the qubit geometry, you can think about say a coplanar waveguide structure. And in this case, um, it is a capacitor kind of in between the center pin here. Uh, here, this is the substrate. Um, uh, yellow here is your is your superconductor, your metal, and uh, green, uh, brown, blue. Those are what I represent as uh, these uh, surface layers that may that may be lo may be lossy. Uh, remember, the crystalline substrate is probably very good. Uh, on top, it's vacuum, it's perfect, uh, but your surface may have may host the TLS. So for this capacitor. It's a, this is a cross section of a, of a coplanar waveguide. Imagine along the direction, it's infinitely extended. Now, the capacitance for this structure her, um, can, be, can be written with some kind of uh, elliptical integral of the first kind. Uh, it's not important, but there's actually analytical expression for these things. And uh, for example, if you have W and G, W and G we call the width of the, uh, the, the center pin, the center width of the CPW and the gap of the CPW. If W and G are equal, you can see C is equal to about 1.22 times the times the dielectric constant times L. So here one represents the part of the capacitance going through vacuum. Epsilon D represents the part of the capacitance going through the substrate. And if W is 2G, meaning a wider center pin, obviously you get a slightly larger capacitance out of that. So um, for this kind of geometry, you can not only ca calculate capacitance, you can also um, try to get the surface participation ratio as well. So here is the result um, that uh, people generally have to resort to numerical, simu numerical simulations because uh, you don't have these kind of uh, elliptical integral that directly give you results. and if you make the same assumption as we did before, the thickness is three nanometer and epsilon s of the of the surface layer is ten. You can you can see you get surface participation ratio on the order of ten to the minus three to the minus four. And what's important here is that the smaller the linear dimension of your CPW, the smaller the W and the G are, the the the, the larger uh, the surface participation ratio you're going to get. So here, this is this PS is calculated for the blue thing for the metal to substrate um, surface, and similarly, you can do calculation for the green and for the for the brown as well. They are going to have uh, different values, but they all scale with uh, with distance. So in fact, you can actually convert these these numbers, these surface participation ratios, uh, into some effective parallel plate distance. So this is saying if you have a CPW with a two and a five micron as its dimension, the surface participation ratio is equivalent to a parallel plate capacitor with a two micron distance between the plates. So this is a this is a, a convenient way to represent how much surface your your dielectric surface participates in your in your overall mode structure. And uh, essentially, you can think in your mind converting any of these planar structures like parallel plates. So for this thing, uh, essentially this capacitor between the center to the ground is equivalent to some kind of parallel plate with uh, 0.7 uh, with 0.7 g as your plate distance and with some linear dimension like that. And the surface participation of uh, for the for for these layers are very much just equivalent to. Um, to, to this kind of parallel plate geometry. So essentially, all you need to know is what is the effective parallel plate distance, and that will be a good idea to inform you uh, how, how heavy does the surfaces participate in your, in your electric mode structure. And this is particularly relevant for many of the planar qubit geometry. For example, people do use a CPW type of uh, geometry to make, uh, to make qubits. So this is a, a type of transmount geometry made popularized by the UCSB group and later on at Google. So uh, the, the center cross, the cross at the center is one of the transmount electrode, and the ground plane is another electrode of the transmount. So the transmount capacitance is basically made out of a capacitance between the between the center strip, between the center cross and the ground plane. 
So its participation ratio is very much a calculation of, uh, of the CPW participation ratio, which can be mapped into, into this type of geometry. Okay, and uh, the reason I go to great lengths to talk about uh, this uh, seemingly very boring and uh, uh, elementary calculation of uh, how much electric field lives on the surface is because in practice, the best trans months uh, from 10 years ago until today, uh, they have been mostly limited by dielectric loss at the surface. And the evidence to that is that you can make the trans bond capacitors with different geometries. You can make them a uh, larger pitch, and therefore they're, they're less sensitive to surface loss, it, or you can make them very tightly packed so that they are very sensitive to surface loss. And you can observe overall trends that when you, de when you decrease the surface participation ratio going from left to right, you see an increase of the qubit T1 time uh, going from bottom to, to up. So this was uh, some aggregated data from uh, 2015 that we plotted, we, we made on a plot. And you, especially using the same material as the red dots that we made uh, a bunch of trans bonds with varying surface participation ratio. And you can see a clear correlation between qubit T1 and, uh, and the surface participation ratio. So this tells you indeed the, these, uh, these uh, surface dielectric loss is, is, is really a very important part of the puzzle. And this is the same for today. Uh, this is a study of uh, tantalum resonators. And you can make a bigger resonator or a smaller resonator. And indeed, the bigger resonator, as I said, lower surface participation ratio, that's going to give you, give you a higher quality factor or longer T1 time. Uh, by the way, a, a, an easy way to convert these things in your mind, Q factor of 1 million is roughly about 30 microseconds of T1 time for resonators or for qubits at around 5 gigahertz. So current state of the art, if you have like a Q of 10 million, that roughly corresponds to, let's say, um, 300 microseconds of T1 time, which is, uh, which is roughly the, the, the current state of the art for, uh, for transmons or for, um, for some of the planar resonators. Chen, the question, um, how does one simulate all these things? Are you going to answer that? Yeah. In more detail, uh, or? yeah. So I I'm actually not going into uh, SPR simulation. So um, yeah, that was my original goal, but I realized there's actually a lot more things than than talking about the surface loss. So um, so here is a very dense summary that I'll, I'll leave it here. I'll, I'll briefly go through that. So uh, numerical simulation of SPR. Uh, so uh, okay. So let me let, let me talk about a few of these points. Um, one is that, uh, remember that these numbers I'm quoting here, minus three, minus four, they, you should understand them in a relative sense. So the exact value, whether your SPR is 10 to the minus five or 10 to the minus three, it's very much dependent on what you assume to be the surface epsilon and what is the thickness of the surface that matters. And these things are, these things are kind of made up numbers. And uh, the goal, the, the, the reason is we, we, we use some numbers and we compare different geometries. The exact, exact values uh, um, doesn't, it, is not as important. But one can indeed use this effective parallel plate distance to represent SPR. And this way, it's more intuitive and it's uh, somewhat uh, better in terms of being like uh, less dependent on parameters. And also a good idea to think about SPR is just to consider any capacitor as some kind of deformed parallel plates. The rule of thumb is that if you have a planar substrate, the bigger the metal pads and the further away they are, the lower the SPR is. And if these two dimensions differ a lot, let's say your, your CPW has a very large W, uh, but a very small G then the smaller value generally is more important. You're generally limited by the, by the smaller out of G and the W, whichever it is. That's, a, that's a just a very crude way of, of saying it. But oftentimes, um, when you make qubits, you don't necessarily have to know exactly what the SPR is, but you just need to have a good idea of this is comparable to some other design, and this is a little, this is perhaps better than the others. And that's perhaps already uh, good enough. It's a, it's a concept that uh, you have to kind of drill in your mind in making those designs. Now, on numerical simulation of these things of SPR, 
this is necessary for quantitative comparison of qubit geometries with especially with varying length scales if your qubit um, oftentimes, especially if your junction leads are important, your qubit like uh, expands from small this small length to large length, and you need you would like to know some more uh, quantitative answers. Then you have to resort to numerical simulations, and that's going to require separate treatments of the edge region of your metal and the interior region of your film. And this is to address the divergence problem of the edges and corners. So. Uh, I have a uh, this uh, we have a, a a paper from a while ago that you can you can refer to in setting up these simulations. Uh, I understand that is not practical enough, and uh, uh, we could um yeah there's no like exact tutorial on on, on this yet, uh, but the principle is there, and. Uh, uh, even without simulating anything, one thing you can remember is that generally speaking, rounding sharp corners is uh, is a good practice in qubit design. You don't really lose much, but uh, you you can gain like uh, some decent percentages or maybe up to up to a factor of two by using kind of more circular shaped things compared to something that is very very spiky. Um, okay. Uh, so so yeah. the I think there there have been two related questions here. The kind of does this mean that qubits have to be big? What can we do to make them small? And and similarly, um, like is there like a, a broad figure of merit about how big a transmon has to be? Okay, uh, very good question. So uh, under this paradigm of SPR calculation, um, it means that a qubit has to be big. And which is exactly what people have done and what the trend has been over the past uh, decade or so. And uh, uh, yeah, if you have a very small qubit, then that necessarily means the, the SPR is going to be large. Um, but there is the possibility that if you can understand the microscopic origin of this dielectric loss is coming from, if you understand what TLS is and you can you can really count them and you can eliminate them, then that opens up the possibility of making the qubit small or even really small. So yeah, but if you assume the same loss tangent for your material, then yeah, the bigger it is, the better. Uh, but um, you cannot make the qubit much bigger than they are today because um, your transmount always have to meet um, in at a Josephson junction. Your capacitor must be connected by a, by a Josephson junction. So uh, if you bring those pads further and further away, that means the longer uh, the, the the wiring, the leads will have to be, and that leads uh, also contains the surface participation ratio, which is not easy to calculate as parallel plate, but you can numerically sim simulate that. And uh, at the end of the day, it turns out, I think, uh, roughly on uh, a few hundred micron, that's the scale um, you can make the, um, the qubit, the transmount in terms, of, uh, in terms of size. And you don't gain much advantage by, by going beyond that. And one last question before we move on. Um, would it be better to make the metal thicker? Um, it generally doesn't help. So uh, because the, the, the length scale, we are already talking about uh, tens of micron to hundreds of, uh, of micron. So the metal thickness on the scale of uh, sub-micron or even a few micron would be very much just uh, approximated as a 2D sheet for these, uh, for these qubit geometries. And they're, they're not going to change the, the, surface, the surface participation significantly. Okay, so uh, yeah, we talked a lot about surface loss. Now, this is another important aspect, which is uh, inductive loss or quality particle loss. So um, if you have a piece of uh, aluminum and uh, it's sitting at 20 millikelvin, um, it really should just be a giant many body ground states of uh, many, many Cooper pairs. And uh, this is the whole kind of magic of the field that the supercurrent should experience inductance, and, but not resistance. So in practice, these, uh, um, these, uh, the superconducting thermal equilibrium, if there's energy in your system, those pairs can break. And these quasi 
the, the Cooper pairs can break into pairs of uh, quasi particles. Quasi particles are formally, they are uh, linear, they are equal superposition of uh, electrons and holes. That's why we call them quasi particles. So they, they really just, um, you can think about them as electrons or holes. And um, in, in superconductor, um, ideally you want them to be pure, have, having no quasi particles. Uh, but if you do have quasi-particles, we usually use this quantity xqp to represent the density of quasi-particles. So it's a dimensionless number that represents the fraction of Cooper pairs that is broken. And uh, the quasi-particles, you can use this excitation, uh, this uh, excitation representation. And your ground state of your superconductor is a Cooper pair condensate. And every quasi-particle must contain at least the energy of delta. This is the superconducting gap, gap energy. So these quasi particles, they are, they are, they are, um, they are elementary excitations in this, uh, in this superconductor. And for example, just to be comfortable with these numbers, uh, xqp of let's say 0.1, that means you have a 90% perfect superconductor. If you do the math, you're, if you if you have an IOVM uh, nighttime magnet at four Kelvin. You compute the temperature that roughly gives you um, xqp of, uh, of 0 0.1. So if you do have uh, um, quasi particles in your superconductor, then these quasi particles they are they have they are instead of uh, having super transport um, in the Cooper Cooper pair condensate, they're actually normal electrons. They're sort of like normal electrons. And if you have a, a LC oscillator. Let's say you have your transmount qubit so that contains energy, which uh, which means you have a you have oscillating electric field uh, across your your tunnel barrier. Then this uh, then this uh, this qubit energy it can exchange exchange energy and excite and bring this quasi particle from its uh, from its low energy state to to a high energy state. So this energy exchange process that can cause relaxation of your of your transmount. Or it can cause like uh, excitation of your of your transmount as well. So this is a uh, an expression between uh, T1 time uh, caused by quasi particle tunneling in the transmount related to the to the quasi particle density. Uh, this is dimensionless number in your in your superconductor. So the coefficient here, uh, qubit frequency uh, superconducting gap. This coefficient turns out to be on the order of unity. So generally speaking, xqp is sort of like the inverse quality factor of your superconductor. So if you have xqp of 10 to the minus 6, that roughly corresponds to a quality factor of a million or your T1 time on the order of a few tens of microseconds. That is what's happening with, uh, with superconductors that are not pure, that contains quasi-particles. Now, quasi-particles can be sort of thought about as a source of inductive loss. And remember, just remember your, your circuit, LC oscillator. We can once again divide the inductive part of your circuit as the junction inductance and external inductance. And we can define inductive participation ratio. That's the inductive energy stored in, in an element versus the total inductive energy. And similarly, your total loss rate will be the sum of a loss rate contribution from each element. And once again, that comes from participation ratio multiplied by the inverse quality of each element. So uh, the situation with the transmount qubit is, uh, is, is interesting because uh, the inductive energy of a transmount, unlike the LC, uh, a regular inductor, uh, the energy is stored in the magnetic field. For a transmount, the inductive energy, the most part of it is stored in the, in the kinetic energy of your Cooper pair. It's stored in a junction. It's, a, it's stored as the junction energy. And only a very small part of it lives in free space as a geometric inductance or free space magnetic field. And a small part lives on the surface of, uh, of the supercurrent on your shunting capacitor. So this means that uh, really the, the part that dominates here is the quality, uh, is, the, is the purity of your, your superconductor near the JJ. So if you have quasi particles in your circuit, that's gonna cause inductive loss in both the JJ and the rest of the circuit uh, with similar XQP. And therefore the contribution from the quasi particle tunneling across the JJ will be typically the dominant component for inductive loss for transmount. Okay. So do you usually have quasi particles in your, in your transmount? Um, ideally, if you have 
the aluminum and uh, in thermal equilibrium, you don't expect any quasi particles at all, no matter how big your, your transmon is. So XQP in thermal equilibrium, you can calculate when you're down to 20 millikelvin, you basically have no more than one quasi particle if you made the earth into a transmon. So that is uh, how low the thermal displacement, displacement coefficient is. So in principle, if your, if your whole thing is at 20 millikelvin thermal equilibrium, then we don't have this problem at all. But in reality, what happens is that there is this phenomena called quasi-particle poisoning. So um, this can happen if you have any kind of external uh, energy dumped on the system that contains energy that is greater than the superconducting gap. So this can happen if you have black body radiation from hot regions of the environment, uh, or you can have uh, some radioactive material that decays or cosmic rays, or you can have uh, highly energetic phonons in your system, which often is a secondary effect when you have like uh, have IR radiation or any other things in, in your system that is energetic. So when these things happen, uh, your Cooper pair can be broken into non-equilibrium quasi-particles. So how do you deal with this? Uh, this is extremely uh, empirical, and uh, these things, um, these things, you may argue none of these are fundamental to your system, so that this may qualify as, in principle, you can remove them, but in practice, it's very difficult. So you must use the best care in shielding your qubit. The, you mu your qubit must be shielded from IR photons traveling in free space. This we usually call shielding. And it must, uh, you must protect it from IR photon traveling down your cables. This generally we call, we call filtering. So these are extremely important to, to, to in, in superconducting qubit measurement. So eventually in the last lecture, um, um, Professor Michael Hatridge is going to tell you a bit more about how do you do these things in practice. Okay, so just to give you a sense of, of these things, of, 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 the, the, of the magnitude of these problems. So typically, if you have a not very good shielding, filtering, or thermalization in your, in your system, uh, you're generally looking at resonant quality particle density on the order of 10 to the minus 5 to 10, 10 to the minus 6. This is going to give you a contribution to uh, maybe I should say T1 instead of gamma 1. Sorry. So uh, quasi particle contribution to your T1 time will be on the order of 10 to 100 microsecond. And this will be limiting the, the lifetime of your, of your qubit, even if you have good dielectric, um, dielectric materials. And another interesting thing is that uh, uh, there is a process called photon-assisted QP tunneling. Basically, um, you can have the infrared photons, or like I'm more referring to photons on the order of 100 gigahertz, which is just above the superconducting gap of aluminum. They can, they can couple to your, to your transmon and break Cooper pairs, separate Cooper pairs into two sides of your, of your tunnel barrier. So this process, um, it can be, it can create almost like equal pro probability of uh, exciting the qubit versus relaxing the qubit. So this often uh, shows up as hot dissipation in your system. So your qubit not only suffer in T1 time, but also you're going to measure some, some, um, some unusually high excited state population. So oftentimes having, having shielding problem, um, giving you low T1, uh, it goes uh, sometimes hand to hand with having hot qubit. Uh, it's not always the case. Sometimes you do get like a hot qubit with uh, with long T one time, um, but oftentimes you get uh, you get these two two problems go together. And the current state of the art, people have been able in cases to do really good shielding and filtering. So this XQP the record is is kind of going towards ten to the minus ten level. And the QP contribution to qubit to T1 time has gone up to like a multiple seconds already. And there are also studies of uh, ionizing radiation, um, suspected uh, cosmic ray impact. So those things happen also on second to minute scale. So we're kind of approaching the limit that we, on such certain setups, we can do shielding really well that we start, this start to become like a, uh, a particle physics detector. And there's also an interesting direction that people do start to, to use is to use normal metal trap and gap engineering to, 
uh, to mitigate quasi-particle problems. Okay, so at this point, I've kind of uh, went through the <laughs> dissipation processes. Now I will try to move on to talk about uh, the qubit environment coupling formalism and go into the phasing. So, so maybe... Jen, real, real quick, there are two yeah. related questions here. Um, how do you measure XQP and can you measure it in resonators? Uh, really, really good question. So XQP is in fact very, very difficult to measure. So uh, the way people, the, the best way to do it um, these days is to make a charge sensitive um, device, make a, make a, make a, a essentially make a bad transmon, make a transmon that is uh, weakly sensitive to, uh, to offset charge. And that transmon will have a sensitivity to the quasi-particle charge parity in the system. So you can monitor the tunneling rate of quasi-particles in the system. And from that, you can infer the quasi-particle density and XQP. And alternatively, there are ways that you can also inject quasi-particles into the, into the system and measure and fit the functional form of, uh, of the dynamics of the quasi-particles. Through the recombination process and trapping process, you can also infer some ideas of what XQP is. Uh, but in general, it is very difficult to, to get it. And in resonators, I'm not aware of a, a way that you can you can measure XQP. Yeah, you can you can raise the temperature and uh, at some point you're going to start to see thermal quality particles, but the um yeah, but the residue value at low temperature, I I don't I don't think there's a way to to measure. Okay. All right. So now let's move on, and we're going to talk about uh, and this uh, more quantum formalism of a qubit environment coupling. So notice that what I've talked about so far, they are kind of a very much. Uh, um, LC circuit classical analysis. Well, it does include Josephson junction, uh, but we treat that as an inductor. So generally speaking, decoherence comes from a coupling Hamiltonian between your qubit and the environment. So uh, the, formalis the formal um, formalism to analyze uh, also all kinds of decoherence, including relaxation and dephasing, is to consider the coupling Hamiltonian. You have a, a qubit operator, so this generally could be um, could be a charge operator or a flux operator of your qubit. It's coupled to some kind of environment operator. So that could be, let's say, a voltage, a current, or some kind of microscopic configuration of your environment. And here I've also thrown in a coefficient that I'm gonna call it coupling efficiency. So because these operators, you can also slap coefficients on that. So how you distribute this coefficient, you can distribute these, this kind of coefficient either way. So um, it doesn't matter, but the form of these operators often matters. And uh, we're going to treat the bath, this environment operator semi-classically. Semi Basically you care, about, uh, you care about the expectation value of this operator as well as its time correlation but you don't necessarily keep track of the quantum dynamics of the bath. That's generally the consideration. And also we're going to let the expectation value of, uh, of this environment operator to be zero without loss of generality, because you can always uh, take out the non-zero part uh, into your regular qubit Hamiltonian. Now, this environment operator, this expectation value, it's going to fluctuate over time which is the point of uh, why you have a decoherence because this environment, you don't fully keep track of its, uh, its dynamics. And this environment operator, um, it, can, it can give you, you can, you can observe this uh, power spectral density of, uh, of this environment noise, which is, uh, uh, which is written as a, as, a, um, as a time integral of the, uh, time correlation function of uh, of the uh, of the C this environment operator, and uh, this type of uh, PSD uh, it is different for different uh, physical origin of the of the noise sources. Uh, but these are some of the typical uh, mechanism of uh, of noise of noise. So uh, in particular, 
uh, you want to know that if you have a noise that is independent of frequency, like the red curve, it's called a white noise. And if you have the, a curve that looks like a green, uh, it's a one over F function that's called one over F noise. Then you also have uh, the, the quantum Nyquist noise that is uh, proportional to, uh, to frequency. And the red and the blue combined together is called uh, Johnson Nyquist noise, which is uh, for which is what a, a resistor in quantum mechanics would give you to to your LSD circuit. So uh, you may find it funny that why this uh, this frequency it has both positive side and negative side. So uh, in classical mechanics, the positive and negative have no difference. But in quantum mechanics, the positive and negative corresponds to absorption and uh, and emission processes between between quantum between quantum objects. So um, an important um, expression to know is that through this, uh, when you have this kind of uh, qubit environment coupling, and you consider this lambda fluctuates over time, you can use that to calculate the transition rates between two energy levels of your qubit, which is follows the Fermi's golden rule, um, which is proportional to the to the the so-called matrix transition matrix element of your qubit between I state and J state. Uh, this matrix element is computed relative to the qubit operator OQ, which participates in, in this qubit environment coupling. And it's proportional to the PSD, power spectral density of the noise, at the frequency of this transition, I to Q. So if you are analyzing a, a relaxation process, you care about omega IJ. And if you, if you calculate a spontaneous excitation process, you're going to care about the PSD at omega Ji, which is the negative of omega Ij. So this is why when you in this, uh, in this quantum noise expression, you can have asymmetric noise. So in this case, your omega Q could be positive. And if you analyze the, so this will have high noise that tells you you have a high probability to relax. And if you go to the negative qubit frequency side, it can be low and it will tell you you have a lower probability to, to be spontaneously exciting from ground state to excited state. So this asymmetry kind of tells you the, um, the, the quantum feature of a, of, a, of a thermal environment. Okay, so this may seem a little abstract and there are actually more content on the, on the quantum engineer's guide that you guys can, can read more and digest it more. But I'd like to just give you some very brief rundown on some of the typical um, operators. So once again, this is your Fermi's golden rule. And capacitive noise from a lossy dielectric, uh, that basically means you have a couple, you have an operator, and uh, this operator on your qubit is a charge operator. A charge operator, often we also write it as 2e times the dimensionless charge operator n. So this is the form of your operator that participates into in this, uh, in this uh, qubit environment coupling. And the uh, lambda, it doesn't matter. It's uh, it's it's basically or some kind of environment charge operator or or equivalent Bay voltage voltage variable. And uh, this noise for capacitive noise coming from lossy dielectric, the noise can be modeled as a finite temperature effective resistor or John Johnson Nyquist noise. So uh, this is the expression that you can calculate that out for for this uh, coupling coefficient multiplied by the by the noise PSD will give you some expression. And uh, here, this uh, here I also have the participation ratio here. Essentially, if you think about uh, uh, your 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 qubit coupled to some kind of a capacitive uh, lossy lossy capacitor then the uh, participation ratio will dictate like uh, how big your coupling coefficient nu there is. Okay, and this is a capacitive noise. And now um, if you have quasi-particle tunneling noise, for quasi-particle tunneling, that describes a coupling between your qubit mode and any quasi-particle microscopic configurations in your, in your, in your, in your qubit. So the qubit, participating operator in this case is actually a sine phi, a sine phi over two to be exact. And this is a, it's not just a phi, it actually gives you interesting physics that you can, that you can read about situations in, in flux, in the, in say flux, flux only half flux is an interesting example. 
But in this class, if we talk about simple transmounts, uh, because for a transmount, your phi operator is just a, is just a kind of a perturbing around zero. So sine phi can be kind of approximated as phi. So essentially your qubit uh, participate in this, uh, in this noise process as a, as a flux operator. And here, lambda is basically describing which side of the Josephson junction is your quality particle living in. And similarly, other inductive noise, let's say if you have quality particle in the electrodes, then your qubit operator is going to be uh, the flux operator. And lambda will be some kind of environmental current or flux variable. So you can see that for a transmog, uh, quasi particle tunneling across the junction is an inductive inductive noise process. You have a uh, you have this uh, operator OQ is basically proportional to the um, to the flux operator. That means it's an inductive coupling between your qubit and the uh, and the environment. Okay, so now we're going to um, talk about uh, uh, different, potentially different types of, uh, of coupling operator. So there is a big dis distinction we, we talked about at the very beginning of the lecture between transverse coupling and longitudinal coupling. So um, what does that mean? So transverse coupling, um, that, means a couple, uh, that means a coupling uh, of uh, the environment to, to the sigma x or to the sigma sigma y of your qubit. And longitudinal coupling means coupling to the sigma z. So you see that if you have an interaction Hamiltonian, that's the charge coupling. This is the charge operator n of your qubit coupled to some environment variable. You know that n can be written as i times a minus a dagger. This is uh, from, your, from your original circuit quantization lecture that you can check. So uh, this type of coupling will give you excitation or annihilation of your qubit of your qubit uh, of your qubit energy. And if you truncate this to two levels in number basis, you can write a minus a dagger uh, for, for an oscillator and you throw away the higher levels. This is basically a, a sigma y um, probably operator. And similarly for inductive coupling, it's A plus A dagger. You can see this is basically a sigma Z operator. And whether it's sigma X and sigma Y is kind of a subject to your definition. But in either case, these capacitive or inductive coupling to the environment, it always give you uh, a transverse coupling uh, like these. And this, this type of coupling is gonna give you, give you dissipation. It excites or de-excites your, your qubit. And there is a different type of coupling you can think about. If your if your coupling Hamiltonian looks like n square, or if you, it looks like chi looks like phi square, then uh, you expand you write n into a minus a dagger or phi into a plus a dagger. Uh, you're going to find the quadratic terms, especially there is a dagger a type of terms in your in your coupling Hamiltonian, and a dagger a. It's number counting operator, or it's effectively a sigma d operator if you truncate to two levels. So this type of coupling, it does not flip your qubit uh, up and down, but it couples to your z axis of your qubit. This this operator uh, from your environment basically is the coefficient of your qubit frequency. So that gives you qubit frequency noise, and therefore this will give you give you dephasing. So whether a, no a certain noise give you T1 process or give you T5 process is a matter of whether this noise couple to your qubit as n or phi, or does it couple to your qubit as, uh, as n square or phi square? Okay, and there is a very big difference in analysis of transverse coupling versus longitudinal coupling. So for the dissipation process, uh, Based on Fermi's golden rule, as we said, you have a noise PSD, and you really only care about the noise PSD at the qubit frequency omega Q, subject to some measurement bandwidth that is relevant to your experiment. And because the because these are noise these noise spectrum near qubit frequency, uh, in general, your qubit frequency is uh, gigahertz. This bandwidth is megahertz. So roughly this, uh, this PSD does not change uh, over this measurement bandwidth. So therefore it shows up somewhat like white noise in these uh, dissipation processes and it's irreversible. And for dephasing, 
Uh, now you see that uh, it couples to sigma z, and because you don't have a Hamiltonian, you because the um, here you care about uh, you care at zero you care at zero frequency subject to some measurement bandwidth, and uh, because the your noise can vary very significantly if you are if you are at uh, one kilohertz to at one megahertz, and therefore. The PSD, the exact shape of your noise PSD matters a lot in, in qubit dephasing or the longitudinal coupling process. So um, I will very quickly go through some of these, uh, these de dephasing noise, typical noises. Why is the flux noise? So um, a, a typical example would be a symmetric transmon. If you have, a, let's say you have a transmon that has uh, two identical junctions and you thread an external flux through it. Uh, you have probably learned that this is a way to make a simple transmon, but with a tunable inductor. So what you have here is a charge energy and charging energy, and you have this junction energy. And the junction energy still has the cos phi term, but the junction inductance is effectively tunable by the external flux cosine phi. Phi external is what we apply to here. Lowercase simply just means uh, uh, dividing the phi by um, by the uh, by flux quantum, and uh, uh, you can see that if your environment introduces some fluctuation to this external flux, I can write it as an operator called delta phi e, and this operator is going to couple to the to the qubit to your qubit Hamiltonian via this term, uh, which is cosine phi, and if I expand cosine phi, I get a second order term. Uh, I will get uh, phi square here, right? So this you can see that it gives you a coupling Hamiltonian that is uh, um, that is the um, that is the environment operator multiplied by by phi square for your qubit. Another way to see this is your LC oscillator frequency is is uh, is proportional to square root of E C and E J, and your E J here is very much modulated by this phi e that will give you. That will give you a, a modulated frequency, which is a, which is a, which is a longitudinal noise. Okay, so um, empirically, this type of noise, uh, flux noise, follow this one over f noise spectrum as shown by the by the green curve here. More specifically, this noise spectrum actually has a coefficient here, a phi. This a phi turns out in many, many experiments, they are on the order of one microfinot per root hertz. And it follows a one over F spectrum, meaning that this S is inversely proportional to omega. If you put an exponent over there and you, you fit it, you get this gamma to be roughly one. One would mean it is actually one over frequency or one over F noise for, 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 this, uh, for this type of flux noise. So what's the physical origin of this type of uh, noise? Um, people believe there are uh, free spins on the, on the surface that uh, can, can hop around. If you have spin moving, spin flipping around, that's going to produce magnetic noise. But what kind of spins and what exactly it is and how do you remove them? And these things are still open question at this point. So this is flux noise. That means that your qubit, if you, your qubit is flux tunable, and in general, unless your phi external is equal to equal to zero or half flux, in general, your qubit will be susceptible to this uh, one over f type of uh, type of flux noise. And a very interesting aspect of uh, the one f over f character, unlike the dissipation side, here the noise is very frequency dependent because you care about zero frequency and how close to zero it matters. And therefore, you can perform this trick called dynamic decoupling. And uh, the Han echo uh, Lev showed you last time uh, is uh, the basic example of a dynamic decoupling. Essentially, if you do your Ramsey measurements, you put your qubit in the equator state, and your, you, it's going to dephase. But then if you put a pi pulse on your qubit, you can refocus all the different phases uh, back, to, uh, back to the original phase. The reason for that is um, your noise is very low frequency, which means your qubit frequency is uncertain, but it doesn't change. It typically doesn't change throughout this, uh, this measurement window. So whatever gives, gives away, whatever processes away will process back through this, uh, this echo process. And um, 
This allows you to basically just use a single echo pulse that's going to remove susceptibility to zero frequency noise. If the noise frequency is zero, then you completely get rid of it. But you can see that this process, in fact, increases susceptibility to the noise at this particular frequency, pi over t, if t is the time you wait to, to do the echo pulse. Because if your noise happened to be flipping sign every amount of time, every t amount of time, then you flip your qubit and the noise also flips, and then you get a constructive effect coming out of it, right? So this actually tells you by putting these echo pulses, you are essentially changing the susceptibility function of your qubit to the environment noise. So this is a, a, a more involved uh, dynamic decoupling process, which is called the CPMG pulse sequences, where you apply many, many pi pulses in the, in the Ramsey protocol and to measure your qubit coherence that way. And you can see that when you put different number of pulses, you're essentially hearing and looking at uh, the, the environment noise at a different, uh, at different, with, at different bandwidth. If you don't do any echo pulse, that's the green curve, you're most susceptible to zero frequency noise. But if you do a lot of echo, you will be specifically looking at noise at uh, some specific frequencies. So this, in fact, turns out to be a way that you can analyze what is the, the noise PSB of your system. This is especially kind of helpful that people have really mapped out the one over F character of, um, of, of those flux noise. Okay, now uh, I'm going to talk about uh, just uh, two more things related to dephasing. So flux noise is very important if you have a flux tunable qubit. If you don't have a flux tunable qubit, your qubit doesn't care about flux, then that's a great way to eliminate flux noise. Uh, but this is an even more general type of dephasing that everyone deals with. This is called photon shock noise. So the coupling Hamiltonian is that you have a resonator, you have a resonator coupled to a qubit. This is your qubit operator, and this is the photon number operator of your resonator. You see, this is just your good old dispersive Hamiltonian chi, right? And if your resonator is not completely in its ground state, but you have it's coupled to some thermal environment, you have photons hopping into the, the resonator and hop out. So these photon coming in and out, in and out into the resonator is called the shot noise of, uh, of photons. And this photon shot noise has a noise spectral density, this S, -dub S omega of this form. It's a Lorentzian form, and um, it's proportional to average thermal photon number in the resonator. If your resonator is absolutely cold, your N bar is zero. If you don't drive it, it's always in ground state, then this noise is zero. But in general, if your M bar is not zero, usually it's very small, 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus four. Uh, but if, you, if this is non-zero, then you do get a, a PSD coming from the photon shock noise. And uh, this function plots, if you plot it, it roughly looks like this. It appears, unlike one over F, it appears very white or very flat at lower frequencies. And it's going to have a Lorentzian roll off at the cavity frequency, which is usually a couple megahertz for your readout resonator. So therefore you're going to have, a, this is your noise character. So uh, if you do some echoes on your qubit, generally you don't see improvement because uh, your echo pulses typically is, typically uh, the spacing is not as tight as the, as the cavity line width. So you're only probing this type, this area of the spectrum. So this type of dephasing often appears as a pure dephasing, as non-echoable like dephasing mechanism for, for your qubit. And it's, this is its, its expression. You plug in omega equal to zero, you compute the dephasing rate, this pure dephasing rate, this is what you get. And this is a very important uh, formula to, to know that helps you analyze why do you have like a high frequency dephasing in your, in your system. And these are also very useful limits. If you have chi is much greater to kappa, this dephasing rate is basically equal to n bar kappa. n bar is the photon number in your readout resonator. Kappa is the, is, the, is the line width of the resonator. And this is basically equal to the thermal excitation rate in your, in your resonator. This statement is basically saying, every time you have a thermal excitation in your, in your resonator, 
then it completely kills your the phase of your of your of your qubit. And the opposite limit is also nice to see if you have a chi is much smaller than kappa, then this is a way to come to really decouple your qubit to to this resonator photon shot noise. So this type of spectrum, in fact, there is a form of experiment called spin locking, which is a little bit more advanced uh, uh, noise spectroscopy technique. You can actually you can actually use this measurement to figure out whether indeed your seemingly white noise is coming from, from hot resonators, because you can see this characteristic uh, roll-off behavior on, your, on the spectrum. Okay, the very last noise that we're going to, we're going to talk about is, uh, is charge noise. Charge noise used to be a very big problem uh, until people figure out how to make, uh, make charge, make basically DC offset charge insensitive devices uh, like the transmons. Uh, so the, the reason transmon was so successful was that it's a, it's a very simple qubit so that got rid of uh, charge noise. Um, but if you make the transmon EJ over EC ratio not deeply in the transmon regime, such as 10 to 40, so that's kind of an in-between Cooper pair box and the true transmons. Cooper pair box has this ratio like a close to one. Transmons will have this to be like above 40 or 50. So in this regime, you have your transmon, transmon energy is actually a little bit dependent on the environment charge configuration, which is which I which I call NG here. So uh, you have this kind of a sinusoid dependence on the environment charge. Then this is a type of uh, longitudinal coupling between your transmon operator to uh, to some kind of environment operator, and uh, you can in fact use this kind of qubit to study charge noise as well. And this charge noise spectral density uh, is also one over F, it turns out. And this coefficient is also very close to one. It's also one over frequency. And um, the inter an, an interesting fact about charge noise is that this constant here, oh, sorry, this should be AQ, is 10 to the minus three electron. So if I go back and uh, you can see that the flux noise coefficient is 10 to the minus six, this is micro. 10 to the minus six of uh, uh, flux quantum every second. So your flux offset typically drifts by about one micro phi naught per second. But on the other hand, your environment offset charge drifts by one milli electron per, sec per second on average. So uh, in natural unit, charge noise is generally much worse than flux noise. It's a much stronger enemy than, than flux noise in general. Therefore, the design principle for qubit, for, for, for making qubit is generally uh, making it like insensitive to charge noise is like a, is like a crucial, crucial step. It's, it's often a, a worthy trade-off to make sure you're not, you're not sensitive to, to, to environment charges. Okay. So to end my talk, uh, I'm going to um, show you a little bit about like uh, the diagnostic uh, processes, so what we do in our lab and I would tell the students do. Okay, so why is my qubit T1 so sad, right? So what are the questions to ask? Um, I will say, uh, do you know your Purcell laws? Prove to me that your qubit is not per cell limited. In general, you should know that. You can do analytical estimates. You can do numerical simulation to prove what's your per cell limit. If you're not per cell loss limited, then look at your qubit design. Do you know what's your achievable loss tangent for your surface? And can you estimate or simulate SPR? What was your expectation of your dielectric, dielectric T1 limit? Right. Then, if, you're, if this checks out and your qubit is way below your dielectric loss expectation, and there are situations your qubit is really hot. If your qubit is unusually hot, then I say that that is a pretty uh, substantial indication of you have, uh, you have IR um, radiation, infrared radiation or quasi-particle problem. So you may attempt this QP tunneling radix measurements if you have the if you have a mean to do that or study quasi particle dynamics. And if you have a very cold qubit, I mean it's not a complete tell, but sometimes it's a it's it's really a question of a fabrication quality control. Maybe you think you have a good 10 delta, but you but you have a lot of carbon like a um, hydrocarbon on your on your chip or whatever. So 
Um, generally speaking, like a poor dielectric quality, generally my experience reflects as code loss. But if you have like a photon assisted QP problems that can give you that can give you really hot qubit. So in any case, you have to work to suppress and make sure a qubit is not is is as cold to the environment temperature as you can. And I would say in general, the goal in in coherence is that uh, you, you try to eliminate per cell and the quasi particle loss, uh, especially this through device design and this is through good cryogenic environment and your goal is to reach the dielectric loss limit given your surface quality um, assuming you are not specifically working to improve the the 10 delta which is a very difficult material science challenge that people still work on today so why is my p5 so sad so the first question to ask is does echo help uh, you should you should compare T2 Ramsey with T2 Echo. If Echo helps a lot, uh, that means you have low frequency noise. Is it charge noise? Well, if your qubit is sensitive to charge noise, then uh, chances are you, you'd better redesign your qubit. So um, this must be eliminated. And if you intend to make a transmon, then check if you are really in a transmon regime and compute your charge dispersion. And if you have a flux tunable qubit, then you know your enemy and you have you should have a clear calculation of what is your one over f flux noise if you're operating at a sweet spot generally you shouldn't be affected too much if you're operating off the sweet spot you should know exactly what kind of a flux noise you're combating and uh, what if echo barely helps if you have a low t low t5 qubit and you echo it and it doesn't improve uh, I would say the majority of the cases, almost all the cases I've seen, they can be attributed to some sort of photon shot noise. That's usually the culprit. So if you really want to confirm it, you can run spin locking and try to find the roll-off frequency that's going to prove to you that's your that's caused by your 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 resonator or some other hidden modes in your system. And in any case, in this situation, what you need to do is to really filter your line and make sure your line is cold, especially your cold stage attenuator is cold. Michael is going to tell you about that in the end. And uh, this is uh, generally the picture for, for, for considering the defacing, the pure defacing problem in your, in, your, in your qubit. Your goal is really to get your resonator modes cold enough so that your T2 echo is close to two times T1 under the dynamic decoupling. You should be able to dynamically decouple relatively easily to get to 2T1 limit, assuming you are doing a good enough job on the, on the photon shot noise part. And there are still mysteries. There are a lot of uh, still low frequency drifts in the system. And uh, sometimes people see low frequency noise beyond charge and simple charge and flux noise. So there are still a lot of unknown questions related. There are certainly situations that T2 Ramsey is far from T2 Echo. So there are still a lot of uh, um, open questions remaining in, in that territory. So that will be kind of my take home message for you guys to think about. And uh, your homework is to make your qubit good. All right. As usual, the sound of just me clapping, sorry. Um, so a few questions that have built up in the end of your talk. Uh, is there a good reference for the physics on slide 39? I guess you very helpfully numbered your slides. Slide 39. Oh. Uh, good reference. I, well, I made this up last night, so I don't, I am not aware of good references on this one. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, then um, when a quasi-particle tunnels across the junction, do you actually change parity? And what is it why does the frequency of the transmon change? Oh, oh, so it changes the parity. So quasi-particles, so let me let me maybe show this slide. So these are the these are the transmon, uh, well, the pseudo transmon energy level as a function of both offset charge and the, uh, the 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 charge parity branches. So if your ng is equal to zero, you live over here. Um, your transition frequency 
is going to be low if you're in the odd branch and you're going to be high on the even branch. So when the quasi-particle tunnels across the Josephson junction, you're going to flip parity and the qubit frequency is going to change. So yeah, it just comes about the, um, it, it just comes down to the Hamiltonian where you have, a, you have an NG term dependent on that. And uh, uh, when you have a, when you have a, uh, the, 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 the fundamental origin of this is that when you have a Cooper pair tunneling, your energy is a, is a two E periodic, but if you have a quasi particle tunneling, your, your Hamiltonian is the E periodic. So that, that derived from the Cooper pair box that gives you this, uh, this charge parity dependence. So uh, here's a question for, I guess, one of your last two slides, the T11, what is the typical error source that makes a hot qubit? Oh, so I would say typically, I would say typically insufficient uh, filtering. That's, uh, that's, if you have, if you have a, um, yeah, if you have a, an input line or an output line that, that is not attenuated enough, or that does not have a good enough low frequency, low pass filters uh, to block out the, um, the high frequency radiation. If you, those filters or your attenuators are very poorly thermalized, so they are at elevated temperature, give you black body radiation, then these things will give you, will give you hot qubit. And of course, if your chip is very poorly mounted and your chip physically is just living on a hot island, that can give you hot qubit as well. Um, I kind of feel that is a less, less frequent situation than, 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 than radiation coming down the line. Yeah, I guess if it's a really bad qubit and it's really hot, you maybe could say it's a hot case or whatever. But sometimes yeah. you see a really a pretty good qubit that's really hot, and then you really want to think it's IR radiation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair. Okay. Um, and then the um, okay. Here's a question. So the so the. Um, how do we link these things we've experimentally measured to a set of Krauss operators for the system? Oh, so the Krauss operator, um, so the Krauss operator is the is is the is the is a process. It's a it's a time integrated um, time integrated like a, a matrix acting on your density matrix, right? So in here we have a uh, here we the first step you will have to do I think um, especially when we consider these noise processes we're not we consider things to be completely Markovian so one thing you can do is to convert these uh, system environment coupling and consider certain environment noise consider the PSD then you can you can get your formalism into the master equation form. So, which will tell you what is the type of jump operator you have from coming from this noise channel, and what is the strength of the jump operator, and then from there you can get uh, you can you can get your your cross operator over over a certain amount of time. Um, of course, it's not com it's not going to work completely when you work with one over f noise. So. Um, yeah, so in that case, I think the time you, you have to run the time integral of, uh, of the system environment coupling and uh, consider the time correlation. So I think there, I think the, um, the, the quantum engineers guide discussion on, on noise, it has, uh, has, has like a, a section uh, telling you exactly how to, how to consider the time evolution operator um, coming from these, uh, these one over F noise. Okay, great. And then to polish us off, two uh, questions that kind of got past us from the earlier participation mm -hmm. ratio part of the talk. One is, is there an advantage of silicon versus sapphire? Ah, okay. So um, maybe you can ask the question in the next class on <laughs> our vacation <application> lecture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, and then uh, there's a good question here about 
is it favorable to design the cavity such that the qubits below the lowest mode of the cavity or I think box? It was a question kind of about 3D cavities versus boxes when you had that Q cage picture. Um, yeah, I think I think that is preferable. Uh, all, all else is equal. So uh, one, one thing is just a peace of mind because your transmon do have a higher level transitions that are below the zero one transition. So have placing your transmon below the lowest mode of the cavity kind of ensures that so you have no qubit transition above any of the cavity transitions and uh, it's it's just harder to collide. But I wouldn't say it's essential. Um, yeah, it's okay. just it's just it's just convenient. Another reason for this is uh, if you have a cavity for readout, then generally you want the readout mode to be higher frequency because uh, it's a uh, shorter lived for the same quality factor. You have a shorter lifetime that helps with readout speed and uh, your qubits at lower frequency for the same quality factor. It gives you longer T1 time, right? So that's just uh, some practical consideration. Okay, great. And and with that, I will remind our guests that we will be back here Friday at 1 p.m. We'll take off next Monday and then we'll finish off Wednesday and Friday the 5th and 7th of July. Yeah, the, you have the invisible, uh, sorry, not the invisible, the silent clapping and hearts and stuff, uh, Chen, once again. Thanks everybody. The You have received an email from Donna Cusa and I have posted it at the top of this talk, a YouTube channel. You see me slowly how to use YouTube. All further talks will be at the same YouTube channel link. So you don't have to keep waiting for the um, updated links. As soon as this thing compiles, we'll put it on the YouTube and you'll just find it in that playlist channel. Okay, thanks everybody. Bye. Yeah, see you, Michael. Bye. You need to stop recording first. Yeah, I have to find my mouse. I lost it. Here we go. <laughs>